We're continuing our partnership with the Ayn Rand Institute, and joining me today is an objectivist intellectual and Rubin Report veteran, Yaron Brook. Welcome back to the Rubin Report. Great to be here. We've done this in like a hundred incarnations in about a thousand different <laughs> studios, yep. and I think we've done it in a couple countries maybe, and all over the United States, so let's see what happens. You ready? I'm sure good stuff is gonna happen. You sure good I'm stuff's sure gonna good happen? I'm sure good stuff is gonna happen. The power of positive there thinking, my friend. All right, so let's, let's focus for this half hour yep. on Ayn Rand specifically. I've done a bunch of these panels and one-on-ones where we've taken a lot of these ideas into the current day or looked at it through a historical perspective. Um, people can watch some of our other interviews to find out how you got interested in these ideas. Give me the, the two-minute button, Ayn Rand, why do these ideas matter? Why was she the one that was able to come up with this cohesive set of ideas that you believe in? Well, I don't have an explanation for why she came up with these ideas. She was a genius, and, 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 and she came up with these ideas. But I think that she, she revolutionized the way we think about the world. She came up with a philosophy that really turns the world upside down in the way people think about the world out there. Her, her philosophical ideas are truly revolutionary. And they're inspiring because they're focused on the individual. They're focused on the individual's life, the value of that individual's life, and what kind of life an individual should live. So, and, and they present an ideal, an ideal of what that life can be like. And people, particularly I think when they're young, when, when we're still idealistic, when we still want to believe that anything's possible, they gravitate towards that. They find that inspiring. They find that exciting. And and uh, and then she provides a whole philosophical foundation for why it's right. So sometimes I hear people say, oh, I was into Ayn Rand or I was into objectivism yeah. when I was young, when yeah. I thought I could conquer the world. But then sort of reality hit or the real world hit or something to that effect. I'm sure it's a, a criticism uh, that you've heard. All the time. I mean, uh, all the time you hear this, and and it's there's a truth to it. I mean, there's a there's a there's something when we're young uh, that that makes people, you know, we're awakening. Uh, we we discover we have a mind. We discover we have some control of our lives. We're looking for what is true. We we don't want to trust our parents. We don't want to trust our teachers. And then we read Ayn Rand, and and there's a certain clarity. There's a vision. There's an ideal that is projected there. But if we don't, I think, hold on to that, and I think it takes courage and it takes a lot of thinking and it takes a lot of integration, integrating into our value system, these new ideas, then I think that we, we go on and, and, and we live a life and, and people are throwing ideas that are contradictory to this set of ideas at us and uh, life might be a little difficult and it, it takes constant mental energy to remind myself, I've got this ideal, I want, yeah, I want to strive. And a lot of people just give up. They, they, they give up on, not just on her ideas, almost all of these people give up on idealism as such. Mm -hmm. And they become cynics. And, and you see this most of the time, the people who say this are kind of cynical. They don't really believe in anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they like to put stuff down and they like to make fun of anything that's a principle. Because they gave up on their idealism nobody should be allowed to be idealistic. Okay, so let's extrapolate some of these ideas. So everyone watching this knows that I believe in the individual. It, it's become the core of my belief uh, so as, a, as a human being, as an individual, yeah. but also my, my political belief. It, it's the start of how you could build any system. Okay, so I think most of the audience is on board when you say that. <laughs> Let's go from there. What are the other pieces that we need to know about? Well, it's a question of what does it mean to be for the individual? And, and, and what is the individual? What are we? What is the es essence of being a human being, of being an individual human being? And here Ayn Rand identifies the idea that, you know, we are a rational animal. We are, we are reasoning being. We, we need to use our minds in a particular way. There's a method to discovering truth. There's a method to discovering what's right and what's wrong. There's a method to thinking. And that, that this is crucial to, to, to well-being. And that this method, this faculty that we have to identify the world out there and to understand it is guided. We guide it. So this is the idea of, of not just being individual entities, but individual entities in control of their own life, having free will, having the capacity to make choices, having the capacity to, to, to choose values and to attain those values. And then there's the question of, okay, what should this individual do? And for 2,000 years, we've been taught a moral code that says, okay, yes, they're individuals, and 
but their, their responsibility is to take care of others. Their responsibility is to be noble, to be good, to get into heaven. They need to sacrifice. They need to be selfless. So even though we identify individual entities out there, their job is to find the needy and go help the needy. And that's our moral ideal, and that's, that's who we praise, and that's who we, we love. And I mean, it's just, why? Mm -hmm. right? If I'm an individual, my life is mine, why shouldn't I live for myself? So she develops, discovers a whole system of ethics uh, 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 that is centered around rational self-interest, around an egoistic system of ethics. So, okay, so before we get into the, yep. some of the specifics of the sure. ethics, I know we've discussed this a bunch of times before, but I think when a certain amount of people hear that, yes. live for yourself, yes. what they, they go to immediately in their mind is some sort of scorched earth situation yes. that we will all then do whatever the hell we want. All the industrialists will pollute the rivers, people will steal from others and all of these things. Now this obviously is a segue to the ethics part of this. So can you explain why that isn't the case? Sure, and this, and, and, and this is, I, I want to I state that this is how we've been trained to think. So the, the altruists, those who, the, the moral teachings that have taught us that our responsibility as individuals is to serve others, have also taught us that the only alternative to serving others is, being, is, is, going is, is to be rails. a, a, a yeah. lying, stealing SOB. That, that's yeah. the only, those are the two alternatives. And I man says, well, wait a minute. Didn't I just say that essentially we are the rational animal? That reason is our means of survival? And if you look out into the world, isn't every human value, isn't everything, anything useful for human life, isn't it a product of reason? Don't we get our clothes and our food and the electricity and everything? Aren't those all products of reason? Maybe reason should be important here before we get to the scorched earth. Let's talk about, so for Rand to be self-interested, to be egoistic means to be a thinker, mm -hmm. to be somebody who uses reason to guide their life. Okay, well, let's think. Is being dishonest to other people, is being a, 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 you know, a, a liar, uh, is that good? Well, well what is lying? Lying is, is faking reality. It's faking the facts to yourself and to other people. Well, is that rational? Well, no, Re reason. Like, like math, like science, requires evidence, facts, the truth. Mm -hmm. If you, there's a term in computer science I often use, garbage in, garbage out. If, if, if our minds are this amazing, I hate to use the term machine, but, but in a sense, this machine that, that, that is guided, if I put junk in it, the product is gonna be junk. And if the product is junk, I can't live for myself because my tool for survival, my tool for achieving anything is, is broken. So lying just doesn't make sense. Is stealing good for me, right? Well, let's think about what does it mean to be good? You know, part of, part of how, what makes us happy, part of, part, of, uh, part of what makes us able to function in the world to achieve our goals mm -hmm. is that we have a certain self-esteem, we have this confidence we can survive in this world, we can take care of, of ourselves in this world, we can produce, we can create, we can put food on the table, to, you know, to put it in simplistic terms, I can put food for my family on the table. That makes me feel like I belong, that like mm -hmm. I, I can take care. Well, if I'm stealing, then somebody else is creating the food, somebody else is creating the product, and I'm using muscle, I'm using physical force to take it from them, I'm completely dependent on these other people, mm -hmm. Where's my self-esteem gonna be if that's the case? Can I be happy knowing that I live off of other people, that I'm completely dependent on them? And there's also sort of a, no. a, a time limit on how long you can get away with it, right? And I don't even mean that in terms of being caught specifically, although most yeah. likely you will be caught, that internally, the internal inconsistency of lying and stealing and all of those things. Ultimately. Exactly, it, it, it wrecks the machinery, it wrecks your ability to, to, to have the self-esteem, it, it wrecks your self-confidence, it wrecks your self estimation of who you are and what you are, it undercuts those. And, and at the end of the day, I truly believe that bad people, lying, stealing, cheating, SOBs, are miserable people, mm -hmm. uh, 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 horrible people. You know, the, the only, I, I often joke that the only profession, the only profession, if you can call it a profession, where lying works, in quotes, is politics. Because if, 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 you, if you talk to business people, or if you talk yeah. to people in any other profession, and we know that that guy constantly lies. Nobody hires him. Nobody wants to do business with him. Nobody wants to deal with him. It, you fail. The, the only place in which it seems to work, in a sense, is politics. And I've never met a politician, and I've met, unfortunately, quite a few of them, who I think of as, as happy, as, mm -hmm. as satisfied, as having that self-esteem. 
they always come across as 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 kind of you know mousy characters who are who who are, who are not. They don't live the kind of life I think. I think that when we talk about being self-interested, be, living the full life, I can't think of a politician. I mean, Bill Clinton looks miserable. He looks yeah, pathetic. he looks banged Awful. up now, and and he would be right because he's lived that kind of life. He's lived a horrible life. So that's really disturbing. That the one profession that that <laughs> doing the worst thing that you can do and lying, right, lying and cheating, whatever else you got to do, that that seems to be the 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 system that we live under. I mean, we live under a political system. Well, well, unfortunately, politics is about power, and it's about it's become about power over other people's lives. And the only way to really justify having power over other people's lives, being in a position of authority over other people, managing their lives, telling what they can and cannot do, is by lying. Because I think I think the, 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 that kind of system couldn't survive in the in the true in the light of truth. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of the reasons. You know, going back to Ayn Rand, one of the reasons Ayn Rand is 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 for capitalism is to not allow politics to control our lives. To, to, capitalism is a system that leaves us as individuals free to pursue our morality, free to pursue our good life, free to pursue our happiness, free to pursue these values without anybody telling us how to live, what to do, what to choose. How, you know what to eat, what to drink, but it but it says no. You're free to do that, and of course the people then that that want power over other people don't have a profession anymore to go into. They 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 they're either they either they either have to change, or they are the people who are losers within a society. Like right. That. So in a way, it's like we're we're dealing a lot of our own personal autonomy to people who gladly would love to control us. We, we rarely do it to people who want to give us back some of that autonomy. Absolutely, and, and this is why the Founding Fathers is such a rare phenomena in, in really human history, is that here was a group of, of political intellectuals, but also politicians who went into politics and, and did the political stuff uh, that, that needed to be done, all in the name of liberty and freedom, all in the name of Taking power away from themselves, you know the the the, the act of George Washington resigning after his second term is is such an important political act of saying, "I am not your king. I, I am not your master. I, you know, I've done a job, and now I'm going to leave, and now somebody else is going to do it. But but I'm your servant, and I you know, and and I'm not here for life, and I'm not here to control you." That idea, those kind of giants, intellectual giants, mm -hmm. but political giants, just don't exist anymore. The more power you give the politicians, right. the more power they take, the more it attracts the kind of people who want that power. And of course, the kind of people who want that power, the last kind of people you want to give that power to. So then how do you unfurl that? Is that purely done at the individual watching this level? Or how do you inject some of these ideas? So a guy like Paul Ryan, for yeah, example, yeah. I remember originally he would talk about Ayn Rand yeah, every now yeah, and again and yeah. talk about uh, you know free market capitalism and all that. He was as sort of close, maybe, as he you- He got punished as, for it. Yeah, and, 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 and he's right, he was mocked for it, yeah. He was, never, he was never consistent about it, but to the extent that he, he had some good proposals, and I thought sometimes he, he said some really good things, he was, he was crucified for it, he was really attacked for it. Look, political change, we get the politicians we deserve. We get the politicians the culture deserves. And it, so the, the change has to happen at the individual level. It has to happen at the viewer level. We have to change the culture in which we live. And when we change the culture in which we live, we will demand different politicians. And this is a process. It won't happen all the time. Although, although there might be a revolution down the road, they, they might have to be kind of, no, we need, we need to radically change it all at once. But that's a very painful, painful way to do it. No. Um, it, it, you know, we're going to have to get people, first and foremost, to go back to the, the, the ethics, to go back to the, this idea of individual, to value the individual, to value their own life primarily, to want to live for themselves, to want control over their lives, to want control over their minds, to want control over what they eat and what they drink and what businesses they, you know, they do and how much they pay their employees and what benefits they give them and what they don't. All the things that the government now controls, people want, have to want Mm -hmm. To own that, they have to want to take back all of that responsibility, all of that freedom. And when they want to do that, then they'll be ready to elect the kind of politicians that will give it. So there's a little bit of a scary picture here, which is, oh, the founders were able to do it because they had to leave the king. 
and we may be heading in that place where it, because sort of what you're saying there is, yeah. it almost has to get worse before it can get better because we haven't hit a we haven't hit a breaking point. Let's say. So so history suggests that when it gets worse, it only gets worse. <laughs> Uh, that it doesn't necessarily, you know, so you get hyperinflation in Weimar Germany, you get Hitler's, you don't, you, you know, so right. there's, a, there's always something even worse than what you think is, is bad. Um, so I, I don't think it has to get worse, but it probably will get worse because I think the process of this kind of cultural change is long. It's hard it, it, and it, it requires a lot from people and we have a lot going against us the educational system against us. Obviously, the political system is against us. I don't think there are a lot of intellectuals who really buy into the agenda that I am proposing, right? That buy into uh, the idea of, of people taking control of their life and really having the ability to make these choices and really owning it. And the idea of complete political freedom, complete economic freedom. So we don't have enough intellectuals advocating for this. The educational system is against us. This is going to take a long time, and the more time passes, the worse potentially things can get. And, and we could get to a position where it's so bad, the only way to deal with it is through a revolution, but let's hope we can avoid that. Right, so all right, let's not go that no. full route there, but that is an interesting segue to something that we've talked about before that I always find fascinating. You, you've often told me that when you're traveling to Eastern Europe, yeah. where they've gone through a little bit of what you're talking about here. They've gone through more totalitarian regimes and more, more socialist uh, style governments that these ideas are spreading there because people are now desperate for them. There's definitely more opening in places that have, that have gone through bad at times and where young people feel like they be, they, they, there's a promise out there that it can't achieve somehow. They, and they still look to America. As, as, as funny as it might seem to us in America fighting the battles within America, they still look to America as a model. And they look to America and they say, we want to be like that. And we, we, we've tried and the Berlin Wall came down and we still tried for, for 25 years we've been trying and everybody's betrayed us. Maybe we need to think a little out of the box. Maybe we need to be a little bit radical. Maybe we need to embrace some ideas that are, that are different, that are completely different than anything else. And I think they have the courage, and, or maybe it's a desperation, but they, they, they are motivated to think outside of the box. But even there, it's hard, right? So mm -hmm. these ideas are spreading, but there's also counter forces there that are, you know, you see in the rise of nationalism and the rise of, of pseudo-fascism and, and the rise of communists even in these places. So there's constantly this battle of ideas going on. And to me, it's sad and, and you know, it's not often surprising that, hey, what are, what are we advocating for? Freedom. <laughs> what, what are we advocating for? The individual, you know, really taking control of your own life and, and the pursuit of happiness. What could be better yeah. than you these radical ideas? radical right-wing This should maniacs. be easy. This yeah. should be easy, but it's not. It, it turns out that it's really, really hard. But, but yes, I think America, in America, what I see with young people is life's good. You know, iPhone, next iPhone's coming out. I don't know where the iPhone comes from. I don't know what it takes to build an iPhone. I don't, know, don't, know, I don't appreciate the genius of the person who, who creates this. Actually, I want to tax the hell out of him. But eh, there's going to be another iPhone and, and life's pretty good. And, and uh, you know, I can debate between Democrats and Republicans, even though the differences between them, you know, sometimes fade away. But, uh, but why be radical? Why, why, why engage in these sophisticated ideas? It's, there's a certain laziness and there's a certain sense in which they're spoiled and there's no, there's no existential, they don't feel an existential threat even though I think it's right there, right. it's right in front of us. Which really is the double-edged sword of all of our freedoms, right? It has given us now so many freedoms and so much prosperity that we can become fat on it and then not realize as the barbarians are at the gate. I, I think that's right, but I wouldn't blame the prosperity completely, right? right? But it, it, it does allow it's, that. It it's a function of it yes, or something, yeah. It allows us to, be, to not suffer the full consequences of our ideas. So when we're closer to, to, uh, to nature, if you will, to, to, to survival, that if we have bad ideas, we suffer immediately. Mm -hmm. When our parents are wealthy and when life's pretty good and, you know, we get bailed out by the state or by our parents or by whatever, then we can make a lot of mistakes and never feel the consequences of those mistakes. We don't feel the consequences of bad ideas we've taken on. And I think American society to a large extent is, is still uh, kind of cruising on the ideas of the Enlightenment, the success of the founding fathers, 
the, the, the industrialists of the 19th century, the geniuses of Silicon Valley, and the rest of us can, in a sense, kind of cruise. We can't, we can't fully succeed in life. We're not going to. We're not going to live a full life by cruising. But we don't quite suffer the full consequences either, at least not materialistically, maybe spiritually. And maybe that's why in mm -hmm. some quarters suicide rates up and drug, you know, uh, the, the, the opioid, opioid epidemic yeah. and things like that. So spiritually, I think we're suffering. But spiritually, to diagnose the cure is, again, a lot harder for, for in, in our culture. Yeah. So let's say that some of the ideas of objectivism really started catching fire and, and started br breaking through the political madness. Yeah. What would our political system look like? Well, I mean, there would be a political party that actually represented the individual and individual freedom and individual liberty. They, they, they would be, and they, and they would have a voice and they would have, they would have a chance uh, politically. Maybe, maybe they wouldn't dominate. The, the political map would be starting to tilt away. You know, I think over the last hundred years, the political map has shifted left constantly towards socialism and statism of various forms. And, and today, I think the right is just as statist as the left. And I think basically the, the whole political map now is solidly on the statist premise uh, with variations within. But basically, mm -hmm. the state is there to control our lives. You know, these want to do it in this way and those want to do it in that way. But it's a little slower the same for thing. these guys, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Maybe a little slower, but maybe in different ways, maybe faster in, in some areas and slower in other areas. But but that both want to want to have control of our lives. There would be some people out there speaking about individual freedom, about individual liberty, about individuals taking responsibility for their own lives, about, uh, you know, it, 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 it stop complaining, go, you know, stand up straight, make up your room, but go find a job, right? <laughs> uh, you yeah. know, get in your car and drive somewhere where, they, where, 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 where jobs exist. Uh, we don't owe people because they're needy. We don't owe people because they lost their job. We don't owe people because they demand something. Um, your responsibility is to live your life. My responsibility as a politician is to protect your ability to live your life that way, protect you from force and coercion. You'd have people talking that language. And it'll take a while before they win. It'll take a while before they dominate. But they at least be a voice. And today, there isn't even a voice uh, that, that, that represents that. And, and you'd see... You'd see a breaking up, I think, a breakup of a lot of the old ways of thinking about about the world. I think so much of our politics has been captured on, on the right in particular by religion. I think that would have to start fading away, uh, you know, uh, uh, and you'd, you'd actually hear secular voices. I mean, Thomas Jefferson was accused of being a, an atheist, and he still yeah. won the presidency. If you accuse somebody today of being an atheist, forget it, particularly right. in the Republican Party. He can't even yeah. win a primary. So. The whole way in which we think about freedom and about liberty and about politics would have would slowly start crumbling in a, in a new vision for, for what for what life could be like, I think would emerge. Right. So there's a there's a risk there because things are still pretty good, but you basically would say that's a risk worth taking. In in what sense? Well, there's a risk in that if you start instituting oh. new ideas, even if they're the right ideas, that we've got something pretty good here. Right, right now it's something pretty good. Maybe it's maybe we're holding it together with tape, but it's something pretty good. But you think that the risk of doing something better is is worth taking? Yes, but also the risk of not doing anything is it's, massive. Right? Yeah. Not only yes, things are pretty good, but things could be amazing. <laughs> things could be fabulous. Things yeah. could be a thousand times better. And it's true. I don't have a parallel universe to show you. Oh, freedom! This yeah. is what results. Right. I'm, I'm not a. I'm not. I don't have a science fiction mind to tell you about the flying cars and the things that we would have, under circumstances. But also, the the just the sense people have about would would have about life and and the benevolence and the happiness and the spiritual prosperity mm -hmm. that would happen if we were free. So, things are pretty good, but they're only pretty good and. Particularly spiritually, I think they're only pretty good. And the, the, what's possible for human beings, what's possible for, for the human mind, for both materially and spiritually, is, is I think pretty unimaginable to most people. And that's kind of a vision we need to be able to project to people and inspire them to do that. So I think the risks are, are insignificant, particularly as compared to the rewards. And I do know what will happen if we do nothing. And that is the band-aids will fall apart mm -hmm. and this will crumble. And, it, and again, might not crumble 
exactly in the way we expect in a sense of the, the material world. But I think people just become darker and more cynical and more depressed. And I don't think it's an accident that there's more, you know, mental illness issues and people are more depressed. Some of it's just we're recognizing it, but some of it is it, it, the world is becoming darker and darker. And I'd like to, I'd like to, I, that's not necessary. None of that is necessary. Did Rand ever think about going into politics? No, no. I mean, it, it, you know, it was, I don't think she ever entertained that. I mean, she, what she wanted to do from when she was very young was she wanted to write. And she, and she had a vision for what kind of writing she wanted. She wanted to portray the ideal man. She wanted to portray a hero. The, 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 what was possible for human life. And if you think about her novels, if you think about Rourke in The Fountain, and if you think about Reardon and Dagny, but ultimately John Galt in, the, in Atlas Shrugged, that's what she wanted. She wanted to, to show what was possible for a human being and what we should strive towards. And, and, and she wanted to provide that inspiration that she gave so many of us who read those novels. And so, so what we could achieve with our own lives. That was what important. And the politics, even the political theory, is secondary to that. Mm -hmm. She ultimately is, a, is about, it's ultimately it's about the ethics, it's about living, it's about making the most of your life, it's about enjoying life, it's about the, the passion that comes from life, living the best life that you can be, that you can live. And, and you need a particular political system to achieve that. That's the reason she's a capitalist. She's not, she doesn't start with that and then go to, okay, this is how people, mm -hmm. and this is what makes us different then let's say libertarians who, who all they care about is the, politi the politics and, and, and you know, the better ones, let's say free, free markets and stuff like that. And what you do when you get that freedom, they don't care about. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's all about what you do. You don't see that as a cohesive set of ideas or a complete set of ideas. It's not a complete say. set of ideas. And, yeah. and when they try to complete it and when they go the anarchist route, I think it completely falls apart and it becomes a very destructive set of ideas. But I think that that what Rand provides is a moral vision for life. And that's, that's unique. And then the politics is what makes that possible politically. But it's not, it's not the goal. The goal is to live your life fully. And that's what inspired me. I mean, I, I, it's easy to get caught up in the politics and the politics are kind of interesting and how do you phase out social security and all that. Mm -hmm. But what's really important is how to live the best life that you can live, how to, how to, how to, how to achieve happiness, how to find, a great romantic partner, how to enjoy good arts, how to, how to have great friends, how to pursue a great career, how to live a full, complete, whole life. That's what a philosophy is all about. And, and I wish that the discussion out there about Ayn Rand was focused on that and let's debate what is a complete, good, successful life look like it you know so i i wouldn't mind opposition say no 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 you know you overemphasize productiveness and really it should be th these other virtues that you know that that would be a an interesting discussion within the realm of how to succeed in being a human being rather than the the caricatures that are made mm -hmm. of her and the caricatures of of self-interest that are made of yeah well look that's why we're doing this partnership and that's Absolutely. why i like talking about these ideas with you and going out there and especially when we go to universities and we talk about these ideas and you know, we did an, a, an event with, uh, with Eric Weinstein, yeah. And, yeah. and he was critical of some of these ideas, yeah. and you guys had a good, a good battle, and, and the audience afterward that was mostly objectivists, they were thrilled that someone came in there for a battle of ideas. And I thought, and, and he even said to me after, and I'm sure he said it to you, well, yeah. how wonderful that was, yeah. that people disagreed on some fundamental stuff, but, but we're happy to do it. That, that's pretty solid. Absolutely, and this is, this is what you have done over the last few years, is you've really brought people together to have those conversations in a respectful, in a in a intellectually you know open environment and facilitate those facilitated those conversations. So I, you know I'm looking forward to to particularly with young people to getting these ideas. I think ideas that are exciting for young people because I I want to inspire people to be idealistic and to to stick with their idealism and to find because I we still live in a pretty cool world, a pretty pretty decent world. But you can be depressed in this pretty cool world, or you could thrive in this pretty cool world. I want people to thrive in this pretty cool world. And I, and I think if we have enough people thriving, if we have enough people focused on living the best life that they can live, then the politics will take care of themselves because those people will not want a, a you know authoritarian telling them what they can and cannot do. Over time, that group will expand and, and, and dominate the political and ideological landscape. So, so the extent that we can get these ideas out there, to young people, that's what gets me excited. 
you did it again, man. You know how to end an interview. <laughs> uh, this is just one in a series of many videos that I'm doing right here on the Ayn Rand Institute YouTube channel, and you can check out the playlist right down below for more of the one-on-ones and some of the group chats that we've had.